Part Four of Planet of Dread by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Four. Moran responded instantly. His hands flew to Hallett's throat, blind fury making him unaware of any thought but a frantic lust to kill. It was very strange that Moran somehow noticed Hallett's hand insanely pulling the trigger of the blast pistol over and over and over, without result. He remembered it later. Perhaps he shared Hallett's blank disbelief that one could pull the trigger of a blaster and have nothing at all happen in consequence. But nothing did happen, and suddenly he dropped the weapon and clawed desperately at Moran's fingers about his throat, but that was too late. There was singularly little disturbance at the luncheon table. The whole event was climax and anticlimax together. Hallett's intention was so appallingly murderous, and his action so shockingly futile, that the four, who were to have been his victims, tended to stare blankly while Moran throttled him. Burley seemed to recover first. He tried to pull Moran's hands loose from Hallett's throat. Lacking success, he called to the others, Harper, Braun, help me! It took all three of them to release Hallett. Then Moran stood panting, shaking, his eyes like flames. He, he, panted Moran. He was going to kill Carol. I know, said Burley distressedly. He was going to kill all of us. You gave me an inkling, so while he was packing Bessendium between the hulls, and had his spacesuit hanging in the airlock, I doctored the blaster in the spacesuit pocket. He looked down at Hallett. Is he still alive? Braun bent over Hallett. He nodded. Put him in the airlock for the time being, said Burley, and lock it. When he comes to, we'll decide what to do. Harper and Braun took Hallett by the arms and hauled him along the passageway. The inner door of the lock clanged shut on him. We'll give him a hearing, of course, said Burley conscientiously, but we should survey the situation first. To Moran the situation required no survey, but he viewed it from a violently personal viewpoint, which would neither require nor allow discussion. He knew what he meant to do about Hallett. He said hoarsely, Go ahead. When you're through, I'll tell you what will be done. He went away to the control room. There he paced up and down, trying to beat back the fury which rose afresh at intervals of less than minutes. He did not think of his own situation just then. There were more important things than survival. He struggled for coolness with the action before him known. He didn't glance out the ports at the half-mile circle in which vision was possible. Beyond the mist there might be anything. An ocean, swarming metropoli of giant insects, a mountain range. Nobody on the Nadine had explored. But Moran did not think of such matters now. Hallett had tried to murder Carol, and Moran meant to take action, and there were matters which might result from it. The matter the crew of the Malabar had forgotten to attend to. He searched for paper and a pen. He found both in a drawer for the yacht's handwritten log. He wrote. He placed a small object in the drawer. He had barely closed it when Carol was at the control room door. She said in a small voice, They want to talk to you. He held up the paper. Read this later, not now, he said curtly. He opened and closed the drawer again, this time putting the paper in it. I want you to read this after the Hallett business is settled. I'm afraid that I'm not going to look well in your eyes. She swallowed and did not speak. He went to where the others sat in official council. Burley said heavily, We've come to a decision. We shall call Hallett and hear what he has to say. But we had to consider various courses of action and decide which were possible and which were not. Moran nodded grimly. He had made his own decision. It was not too much unlike the one that, carried out, had made him seize the Nadine for escape from Corius. But he'd listen. Harper looked doggedly resolved. Braun seemed moody, as usual. I'm listening, said Moran. 
Hallett, said Burley regretfully, intended to murder all of us, and with your help, take the Nadine to some place where he could hope to land without spaceport inspection. Moran observed, He didn't discuss that part of his plans. He only asked if I'd make a deal to escape being marooned. Yes, said Burley, nodding, I'm sure. My own idea, said Moran, when I tried to seize the Nadine, was to try to reach one of the several newly settled planets where things aren't too well organized. I'd memos of some such planets. I'd hoped to get to ground somewhere in a wilderness on one of them and work my way on foot to a new settlement. There I'd explain that I'd been hunting or prospecting or something of the sort. On a settled planet that would be impossible. On a brand new one people are less fussy, and I might have been accepted quite casually. Hallett may have had some such idea in mind, agreed Burley. With a few Bessendium crystals to show, he would seem a successful prospector. He'd be envied, but not suspected to be sure. But, said Moran dryly, he'd be best off alone. So if he had that sort of idea, he intended to murder me, too. Burley nodded. Undoubtedly, but to come to our decision, we can keep him on board under watch, as we did you, and leave you here. This has disadvantages. We owe you much. There would be risk of his taking someone unawares and fighting for his life. Even if all went as we wished, and we landed and dispersed, he could inform the spaceport officials anonymously of what had happened, leading to investigation and the ruin of any plans for the future revival of our underground. Also, it would destroy any hope for your rescue. Moran smiled wryly. He hadn't much hope of that if he were marooned. We could leave him here, said Burley unhappily, with you taking his identity for purposes of landing. But I do not think it would be wise to send a ship after him. He would be resentful. If rescued, he would do everything possible to spoil all our future lives, and we are fugitives. Ah, yes, said Moran, still more wryly amused. I am afraid, said Burley reluctantly, that we can only offer him his choice of being marooned or going out the airlock. I cannot think of any other alternative. I can, said Moran. I'm going to kill him. Burley blinked. Harper looked up sharply. We fight, said Moran grimly, armed exactly alike. He can try to kill me. I'll give him the same chance I have, but I'll kill him. They used to call it a duel, and they came to consider it very immoral business. But that's beside the point. I won't agree to marooning him here. That's murder. I won't agree to throwing him out the airlock. That's murder, too. But I have the right to kill him if it's in fair fight. That's justice. You can bring him in and let him decide if he wants to be marooned or fight me. I think he's just raging enough to want to do all the damage he can, now that his plans have gone sour. Burley fidgeted. He looked at Harper. Harper nodded grudgingly. He looked at Braun. Braun nodded moodily. Burley said fretfully, Very well, Harper. You and Braun bring him here. We'll see what he says. Be careful. Harper and Braun went down the passageway. Moran saw them take out the blasters they'd worn since he took over the ship. They were ready. They unlocked and opened the inner airlock door. There was silence. Harper looked shocked. He went in the airlock while Braun stared, for once startled out of moodiness. Harper came out. He's gone, he said in a flat voice. Out the airlock. All the rest went instantly to look. The airlock was empty. By the most natural and inevitable of oversights, when Hallett was put in it for a temporary cell, no one had thought of locking the outer door. There was no point in it. It only led out to the nightmare world. And out there Hallett would be in monstrous danger. He'd have no food. At most his only weapon would be the torch Moran had carried to the Malabar and brought back again. He could have no hope of any kind. He could feel only despair unthinkable and horror undiluted. There was a buzzing sound in the airlock. A spacesuit hung there. 
The helmet phone was turned on. Hallett's voice came out, flat and metallic and desperate and filled with hate. What are you going to do now? You'd better think of a bargain to offer me. You can't lift off. I took the fuel block so Moran couldn't afford to kill me after the rest of you were dead. You can't lift off the ground. Now give me a guarantee I can believe in, or stay here with me. Harper bolted for the engine room. He came back, his face ashen. He's right. It's gone. He took it. Moran stirred. Burley wrung his hands. Moran reached down the spacesuit from whose helmet the voice came tinnily. He began to put it on. Carol opened her lips to speak, and he covered the microphone with his palm. I'm going to go out and kill him, said Moran very quietly. Somebody else had better come along just in case. But you can't make a bargain with him. He can't believe in any promise, because he wouldn't keep any. Harper went away again. He came back struggling into a spacesuit. Braun moved quickly. Burley suddenly stirred and went for a suit. We want torches, said Moran evenly, for our own safety, and blasters because they'll drop Hallett. Carol, you monitor what goes on. When we need to come back, you can use the direction finder and talk us back to the yacht. But, but— What are you going to do? rasped the voice shrilly. You've got to make a bargain. I've got the fuel block. You can't lift off without the fuel block. You've got to make a deal. The other men came back. With the microphone still muffled by his hand, Moran said sharply, He has to keep talking until we answer, but he won't know we're on his trail until we do. We keep quiet when we get the helmets on, understand? Then he said evenly to Carol, Look at that paper I showed you if, if anything happens. Don't forget. Ready? Carol's hands were clenched. She was terribly pale. She tried to speak and could not. Moran, with the microphone still covered by the palm of his hand, repeated urgently, Remember, no talking. He'll pick up anything we say. Use gestures. Let's go. He swung out of the airlock. The others followed. The one certain thing about the direction Hallett would have taken was that it must be away from the wreck, and he'd have been in a panic to get out of sight from the yacht. Moran saw his starting point at once. Landing, the Nadine had used rockets for easing to ground, because it is not possible to make delicate adjustments of interplanetary drive. A takeoff, yes. But to land, even at a spaceport, one uses rockets to cushion what otherwise might be a sharp impact. The Nadine's rockets had burned away the yeasty soil when she came to ground. There was a burnt-away depression down to bedrock in the stuff all around her. But Hallett had broken the scorched, crusty edge of the hollow as he climbed up to the blanket-like surface skin. Moran led the way after him. He moved with confidence. The springy, sickeningly uncertain stuff underfoot was basically white that had been soiled. Between the Nadine's landing spot and the now glutted wreck, it happened that only that one color showed, but scattered at random in other places, there were patches of red mold and blue mold and black dusty rust and greenish surface fungi. Twenty yards from the depression in which the Nadine lay, Hallett's footprints were clearly marked in a patch of orange-yellow ground cover, which gave off impalpable yellow spores when touched. Moran gestured for attention and pointed out the trail. He gestured again for the others to spread out. Hallett's voice came again. He'd left the Nadine's lock because he could make no bargain for his life while in the hands of his companions. He could only bargain for his life if they could not find him or the precious fuel block without which the Nadine must remain here forever. But from the beginning he knew such terror that he could not contrive himself a bargain that could possibly be made. He chattered agitatedly, not yet sure that his escape had been discovered. At times he seemed almost hysterical. Moran and the others could hear him pant sometimes as a fancied movement aroused his panic. Once they heard the noise of his torch as he burned a safety hole in the ground, but he did not use it. 
he hastened on. He talked desperately. Sometimes he boasted, and sometimes he tried cunningly to be reasonable. But he hadn't been prepared for the absolute failure of what should have been the simplest and surest form of multiple murder. Now, in a last-ditch stand, he hysterically abused them for taking so long to realize that they had to make a deal. His four pursuers went grimly over the elastic surface of this world upon his trail. The Nadine faded into the mist. Off to the right a clump of toadstools grew. They were taller than any of the men, and their pulpy stalks were more than a foot thick. Hallett's trail in the colored surface moles went on. The giant toadstools were left behind. The trail led straight toward an enormous object, the height of a three-story house. When first glimpsed through the mist, it looked artificial. But as they drew near, they saw that it was a cabbage, gigantic, with leaves impossibly huge and thick. There was a spike in its middle on which grew cruciform faded flowers four feet across. Then Hallett screamed. They heard it in their helmet phones. He screamed again. Then for a space he was silent, gasping, and then he uttered shrieks of pure horror. But they were cries of horror, not of pain. Moran found himself running, which was probably ridiculous. The others hastened after him, and suddenly the mistiness ahead took on a new appearance. The ground fell away. It became evident that the Nadine had landed upon a plateau with levels below it and very possibly mountains rising above. But here the slightest rolling plateau fell sheer away. There was a place where the yeasty soil, but here it was tinted with a purplish overcast of foliated fungus, where the soil had given way. Something had fallen here. It would have been Hallett. He'd gone too close to a precipice, moving agitatedly in search of a hiding place in which to conceal himself until the people of the Nadine made a deal he could no longer believe in. His cries still came over the helmet phones. Moran went grimly to look. He found himself gazing down into a cross valley, perhaps two hundred feet deep. At the bottom there was the incredible green-growing things. But they were not trees. They were some flabby weed with thick reddish stalks and enormous pinnate leaves. It grew here to the height of oaks, but Hallett had not dropped so far. From the anchorages on Bear Rock, Great glistening cables reached downward to other anchorages on the valley floor. The cables crossed each other with highly artificial precision at a central point. They formed the foundation for a web of geometrically accurate design and unthinkable size. Cross cables of sticky stuff went round and round the center of the enormous snare, following a logarithmic spiral with absolute exactitude. It was a spider's web, whose cables stretched hundreds of feet, whose bird-limed ropes would trap and hold even the monster insects of this world, and Hallett was caught in it. He'd tumbled from the cliff edge as fungoid soil gave way under him. He'd bounced against a sloping, fungus-covered rocky wall, and with fragments of curdy stuff about him had been flung out into the snare. He was caught as firmly as any of the other creatures on which the snare's owner fed. His shrieks of horror began when he realized his situation. He struggled, setting up insane vibrations in the fabric of the web. He shrieked again, trying to break the bonds of cordage that clung the more horribly as he struggled to break free. And the struggling was most unwise. "'We want to cut the cables with torches,' said Moran sharply. If we can make the web drop, we'll be all right. Web spiders don't hunt on the ground. Go ahead, make it fast. Burley and the others hastened to what looked like a nearly practicable place on which to descend. Moran moved swiftly to where one cable of the web was made fast at the top. It was simply sanity to break down the web, by degrees, of course, to get at Hallett. But Hallett did not cooperate. He writhed and struggled and shrieked. 
His outcry, of course, counted for nothing in the satanic cacophony that filled the air. All the monsters of the planet seemed to make discordant noises. Hallet could add nothing. But his struggles in the web had meaning to the owner of the trap. They sent tiny tremblings down the web cables, and this was the fine mathematical creation of what was quaintly called a garden spider on other worlds. Epira Fasciata. She was not in. She sat sluggishly in a sheltered place, remote from her snare. But a line, a cord, a signal cable went from the center of the web to the spider's retreat. She waited with implacable patience. One foreleg, sheathed in ragged and somehow revolting fur, resting delicately upon the line. Hallet's frantic struggles shook the web, faintly to be sure, but distinctively. The vibrations were wholly unlike the violent thrashing struggles of a heavy beetle or a giant cricket. They were equally unlike those flirtatious, seductive pluckings of a web cable, which would mean that an amorous male of her own species sought the grisly creature's affection. Hallet made the web quiver as a small prey would shake it. The spider would have responded instantly to bigger game, if only to secure it before the vast snare was damaged by frenzied plungings. Still, though there was no haste, the giant rose and, in leisurely fashion, traversed the long cable to the web's center. Moran saw it. Hallet! he barked into his helmet phone. Hallet, hold still! Don't move! He raced desperately along the edge of the cliff, risking a fall more immediately fatal than Hallet's. It was idiotic to make such an attempt at rescue. It was sheer folly. But there are instincts one has to obey against all reason. Moran did not think of the fuel block. Typically, Hallet did. I've got the fuel block, he gasped between screams. If you don't help me. But then the main cable nearest him moved in a manner not the result of his own struggles. It was the enormous weight of the owner of the web, moving leisurely on her own snare, which made the web shake now. And Hallet lost even the coherence of hysteria and simply shrieked. Moran came to a place where a main anchor cable reached bedrock. It ran under yeasty ground cover to an anchorage. He thrust his torch deep, feeling for the cable. It seared through. The web jerked wildly as one of its principal supports parted. The giant spider turned aside to investigate the event. Such a thing should happen only when one of the most enormous of possible victims became entangled. Moran went racing for another cable anchorage, but when he found where the strong line fastened, it was simply and starkly impossible to climb down to it. He swore and looked desperately for Burley and Braun and Harper. They were far away, hurrying to descend, but not yet where they could bring the web toppling down by cutting other cables. The yellow-banded monster came to the cut end of the line. It swung down. It climbed up again. Hallet shrieked and kicked. The spider moved toward him. Of all the nightmarish creatures on this nightmare of a planet, a giant spider with a body eight feet long and legs to span as many yards was most revolting. Its abdomen was obscenely swollen. As it moved, its spinnerets paid out newly formed cord behind it. Its eyes were monstrous and murderously intent. The ghastly, needle-sharp mandibles beside its mouth seemed to move lustfully with a life of their own, and it was somehow ten times more horrible because of its beastly fur. Tufts of black hairiness, half yards in length, streamed out as its legs moved. There was another cable still. Moran made for it. He reached it where it stretched down like a slanting tightrope. He jerked out his torch to sever it and saw that to cut it would be to drop the spider almost upon Hallet. It would seize him then because of his writhings, but not to cut it. He tried his blaster. He fired again and again. The blaster bolts hurt. The spider reacted with fury. The blaster would have killed a man at this distance, 
though it would have ignored a chitin-armored beetle, but against the spider the bolts were like bites. They made small wounds, but not serious ones. The spider made a bubbling sound which was more daunting than any cry would have been. It flung its legs about, fumbling for the thing that it believed attacked it. It continued the bubbling sounds. Its mandibles clashed and gnashed against each other. They were small noises in the din which was the norm on this mad world, but they were more horrible than any other sounds Moran had ever heard. The spider suddenly began to move purposefully toward the spot where Hallet jerked insanely and shrieked in heart-rending horror. Moran found himself attempting the impossible. He knew it was impossible. The blast pistol hurt, but did not injure the giant because the range was too long. So it was totally unjustifiable. He found himself slung below the downward slanting cable and sliding down its slope. He was going to where the range would be short enough for his blast pistol to be effective. He slid to a cross cable and avoided it and went on. Burley and Braun and Harper were tiny figures, very far away. Moran hung by one hand and used his free hand to fire the blaster once more. It hurt more seriously now. The spider made bubbling noises of infinite ferocity, and it moved with incredible agility toward the one object it could imagine as meaning attack. It reached Hallett. It seized him. Moran's blast pistol could not kill it. It had to be killed now. He drew out his torch and pressed the continuous flame stud. Raging, he threw it at the spider. It spun in the air, a strange blue-white pinwheel in the gray light of this planet's day. It cut through a cable that might have deflected it. It reached the spider, now reared high and pulling Hallett from the sticky stuff that had captured him. The spinning torch hit. The flame burned deep. The torch actually sank into the spider's body. And there was a titanic flame and an incredible blast, and Moran knew nothing. A long time later he knew that he ached. He became aware that he hurt. Still later he realized that Burley and Brawn and Harper stood around him, He'd splashed in some enormous thickness of the yeasty soil, grown and fallen from the cliff edge, and it was not solid enough to break his bones. Harper, doubtless, had been most resolute in digging down to him and pulling him out. He sat up and growled at innumerable, unpleasant sensations. That, he said painfully, was a very bad business. It's all bad business, said Burley in a flat and somehow exhausted tone. The fuel block burned. There's nothing left of it or Hallett or the spider. Moran moved an arm, a leg, the other arm and leg. He got unsteadily to his feet. It was bacendium and uranium, added Burley hopelessly. And the uranium burned. It wasn't an atomic explosion. It just burned like sodium or potassium would do. But it burned fast. The torch flame must have reached it, he added absurdly. Hallett died instantly, of course. Which is better fortune than we're likely to have. Oh, that, said Moran. We're all right. I said I was going to kill him. I wasn't trying to at the moment, but I did, by accident. He paused and said dizzily, I think he should feel obliged to me. I was distinctly charitable to him. Harper said grimly, But we can't lift off. We are all marooned here now. Moran took an experimental step. He hurt, but he was sound. Nonsense, he said. The crew of the Malabar went off without taking the fuel block from the wreck's engines. It's in a drawer in the Nadine's control room with a note to Carol that I asked her to read should something happen to me. We may have to machine it a little to make it fit the Nadine's engines, but we're all right. Carol's voice came in his helmet phone. It was shaky and desperately glad. You're all right. Quite all right. Please, hurry back. We're on our way, said Moran. He was pleased with Carol's reaction. He also realized that now there would be the right number of people on the Nadine. 
they would take off from this world and arrive reasonably near due time at Loris without arousing the curiosity of spaceport officials. He looked about him. The way the others had come down was a perfectly good way to climb up again. On the surface above, their trail would be clear on the multicolored surface rusts. There were four men together, all with blast pistols and three with torches. They should be safe. Moran talked cheerfully, climbing to the plateau on which the Nadine had landed, trudging along with the others across a world on which it was impossible to see more than a quarter mile in any direction. But the way was plain. Beyond the mist, Carol waited. End of Part 4 End of Planet of Dread by Murray Leinster This story read by Phil Chenevere